Shore. How's everybody doing today? It is great to see you guys. If you're watching out in the atrium, I want to give a shout out to you. And thanks so much for joining us at Church Online, for tuning in with us today. We're real excited that you're here. So we are in this series called Relational Vampires, How to Love the People That Suck the Life Out of You. Can I get an amen? Because we all need help with that, right? Now, well, I want to just, just define our terms here a little bit. So you have life-giving people that show up in your life. And these are people who encourage you, who inspire you, who strengthen you, who just lift you up. And when you leave that conversation or that company, you're just like, man, I'm ready to take on the world. And then you have what we're calling a relational vampire. They suck the life out of you. Because by the end of that conversation, you're drained and you're depleted. And maybe you're with them for a little bit of time and you're weary. These are the people that we're going to be talking about. Now, last week, Pastor Vince, our senior pastor, kicked the series off, and we were talking about critical people. How do we uh, identify them? How do we manage them? How do we deal? How do we love critical people? Because we have all encountered that at one, in, at one time in our lives. Today, what we're going to talk about is the overly needy people. Now, please understand, I'm not talking about people in need, okay? There's always going to be people in need. What I'm talking about is the overly needy people, that no matter what you do, it never seems to be enough. And next week, as we continue the series, we're going to be talking about those who like to try to control the situation, manipulative people. And Pastor Vince is going to be digging into that a little bit. But that's next week. And before we get into that, like I said, today is overly needy. Now, how many of you agree that every group in life has challenging people, right? We can, we can all agree to that. Every, every group, no matter what kind of group it is, there's always that one crazy person, Okay, whether it's in your small group or it's your family or it's in your workplace or at school or wherever, there's always that one crazy person. In fact, I think the Bible even says that where two or three are gathered, at least one of them is crazy. <laughs> now, by a show of hands, how many believe that? You know that there's one challenging person. Okay, keep your hands up. Keep, no, no, keep them up. Keep them up. Look to the people around you who are not raising their hand and tell them there's always one. <laughs> okay. There's always one. There's always one. But the question is, how do we love and care for these needy people? I'm still hearing a little bit of ring. How do we love and care for these needy people? You see, they're hurting. But sometimes they just need that extra attention. And, and we want to help. But sometimes we're not sure how to help. And, and you know them when you see them. Because you, you sometimes, I don't know if you've, you've done this before, but you're in Wegmans. And you see them and you're like, oh, go to the next aisle. Because you know that that conversation is going to be long. You know it's going to be just something riddled with drama and crisis. You know that this person's going to be a hot mess. And you know they're on the struggle bus and they're trying to figure everything out. And you get to hear that all the time. Sometimes it's the same negative story. And then we run into this problem where you feel like, you know, I don't know what to do. So I do something for them. And it's never enough. And it's exhausting. And you give. And they need more. So how do we love these people? How do we love the people that suck the life out of us? How do we honor God in loving them and also in a way that's helping them? Well, before we can dig into that, I want to just go through a couple different things. We're going to look at the markers of, of needy people. We need to identify who they are in order to help them properly. All right, so I'm going to go through these first two sections fairly quickly because I want to spend the, the most of the bulk of our time today in section three. But these are the markers of needy people. There's five different things, and there's more than this, but these are some of them. They, they may dominate the conversation. Number one is they may dominate the conversation. And these are those people that you just know it's just riddled with crisis and drama, and you can't get two words in, and it's exhausting. All right, they dominate the conversation. The second marker might be that they, 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 they may have a negative mindset. They, they may have this negative mindset that they can never get a break. That it's ne they, no matter what they do, no matter how many people help them, it's just, it's always something and, oh, what was me and I can never get ahead. Number three, they may believe that they're the victim. They may believe that they're the victim, that everything and everyone is out to get them. And doesn't matter if Jesus Christ walked in this room right now, the sky is still falling. Right? How many of you guys remember there was a skit on Saturday Night Live, I don't know, it was like 20 years ago with Penelope. Do you remember Penelope? So Penelope would walk in, she was this red-haired woman, and she, no matter what situation it was, she was always one-upping the other person. 
And so she would come in and be like, and this guy would walk in and he'd be like, oh man, yeah, I just, I just got pulled over and uh, something happened with my car. And she, and she would just sneak in. Yeah, well, I, I blew up my car, so. Anybody remember that? No, I'm talking to myself. Okay. But it's that idea. It's just like, it's always, you're always the victim. It's always worse. Number four, they may never, they may not be satisfied with your help. No matter what you do, they're always coming back for more. Or worse, they're offended by how you did help them. We've all come across people like this. The last marker for needy people, they may tend to fish for compliments. This is always a tricky one. They may tend to fit, uh, fish for compliments. You see, what they're really doing is they're looking for validation. Did I do a good enough job? Was that good enough? Is that going to meet it? It, it, it? Is that okay? Is that okay? And really, it's, it's a person who's just simply insecure, and that's not how it's supposed to be. Yet, these people come, we come across these people in our lives, and we have to figure out how do we love them? How do we love them? Now, what's interesting is that um, the Apostle Paul alludes to not necessarily needy people, but how we are to live when he's writing to Titus. Titus was a young pastor uh, commissioned to oversee the churches in Crete. And he was writing this book to him to say, okay, here's how you're to act. This is what godly living looks like. And he specifically calls out men, women, young men, young women, older men, older women. Here's how you're to act within the church. And he's writing to Titus, and he says this, in verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 11, he says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good, these then are the things that you should teach, encourage, and rebuke with all authority. Do not let them despise you. I'm just going to go back through. There's a lot there. And we're just going to spend just a minute on this. But what he's talking about is godly living. He's saying you're living life in light of the gospel. We just spent a whole series on unpacking what the gospel is. The good news of Jesus Christ. That God had a redemption plan for mankind. Sent his son Jesus to the world to pay for the penalty of sin. So that all may know, that the world may know. And he's saying, when you're living life in light of this gospel, he says it teaches us, the grace of God that has appeared, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Worldly passions literally means earthly desires or earthly lusts. Oftentimes when we hear the word lust, we ascribe it to sexual sin. But really what the word lust means is intense desire. Okay? He says, this enables us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, but instead that we are self-controlled, that we are upright, and we're living godly lives in the present age while we wait for the blessed hope. What's the blessed hope? The appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself to redeem us. What Paul is ultimately saying here is that he's going to do whatever it takes and encouraging Titus to do the same. Do whatever it takes to bring your life in line with God. Do whatever it takes. Say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Be self-controlled and upright. Wait for the blessed hope, which is the appearing of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He says that when you look back on God's favor, when you look back on what God has done for us, it affects our behavior. When you look back on what God has done, it affects our behavior now. And then he says that when you're in this, God, this idea of godly living, that's when you're looking to the future. So we're looking back and we're looking forward. And he says, in doing these things, you say no to ungodliness and earthly desires, worldly passions. You see, God doesn't want us to focus on the worldly things. Now, when we say worldly things or worldly possessions or however you decide to say that or what your translation says, we often think, well, you know, it's that party life, it's that sin, it's that stuff, it's all these different things. But you know what? It can be very nuanced. And by application, I think this is part of that. Is that we go through those five markers that, that this ungodliness, this worldly passions, these desires, I'm, I'm looking for something else in someone else rather than God himself. 
You see, God doesn't want us to focus on the worldly things. God doesn't want us to be focusing on looking for handouts and for people to constantly come alongside us and give, 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 give. No, he wants us to focus on what? On godliness and on his appearing. We look back to the past of what he's done so that we live a life of godliness and we look forward to his coming. That's what we're looking forward to. So I just say that to kind of set the stage of where we're going today. That's ultimately what our goal is here. So the question still remains, how do we love and help those who are needy? How do we love and help needy people? You see, we want to help them. We care about them. How many of you guys have been in that situation where maybe you're driving through the city or you're down? I, I see it in Henrietta and out on the, um, on the west side a lot where you, you pull up to this intersection and then there's that homeless person and they're standing there with a sign and you're like, oh, I don't know what to do. My wife actually now packs... Uh, we, we keep a 24 case of water bottles in the trunk for that very reason. So if we pull up, like, you know, the, the mission organizations we work with to say, don't give them money because sometimes there's, a, there's other issues that are in, in play, but we'll make sure that we give them a bottle of water or something so that we can at least have a 30-second conversation before the light turns green. But you want to help them. So what do we do? What do you do when it's never enough? What do you do when you're trying to help somebody and it's not going well and you end up pulling back to regroup and now you feel guilty because you're kind of leaving them stranded, right? You want to help, but sometimes, let's face it, we help in the wrong way, and it ends up hurting them and hurting us. So these last three things that I want to look at before we dig into how do we love these people are some of the nuances of needy people. See, we kind of identified who they are. Now let's, let's talk about just for a minute why. Why is it the way that it is? So the first thing, and here's the nuances of needy people, the first thing is that sometimes they tend to confuse needs and wants. Needy people tend to confuse needs and wants. Somebody will come in to the church and say, hey, listen, I need need money to make my car payment. I'm really strapped. Things are tight. But you watch, and I'm watching, and they walk in, and they have a brand new Apple Watch sporting the Yeezys on their feet, and they have the subscription to Apex Legends and Minecraft that they're playing. And I'm like, hold on a second. You need money for your car payment? No, you want money for your car payment. You need to learn how to budget. You see what I mean? There's this confusion of needs and wants. This is a true story. Um, Somebody came into the church, this was years ago, and uh, we we have a, a way that we handle benevolence. Somebody comes in and we try to help them financially. We don't give them money directly, but we'll pay the bill, and we have a whole process that we go through. Anyway, this couple comes in, and we go, we're going through the process, and I'm helping them map out their finances and saying, okay, where, where are we with things? And I said, okay, do you have a car payment? They said, yeah, we have a car payment. I said, okay, how much is your car payment? $900 a month. Are you driving a Bentley? What are you driving that's $900 a month? And I'm thinking to myself, that, you know, is it heated seats, gold lace trim? Like, what is this thing? She goes, a Ford Focus. Now, if you don't know what a Ford Focus is, it's a tiny little sedan. I drove one forever. They're just these little, you know, little compact cars. $900 a month on a Ford Focus? So the conversation pursued, and I'm like, what are we, what are we doing? Like, well, I re- we really need money to help make it. I said, guys, you got to sell your car. You got to reorganize. You got to get the house in order here. Things are upside down. Well, no, we really need the money. And I said, no, you don't need the money. You need to reprioritize. Confused needs with wants. Number two is that needy people often struggle to understand boundaries. I don't like talking about this one because this one can, this one can be the hit home for some people. I know it hit home, hits home for me. But you see, they, they have a hard time understanding boundaries. I have a family member who um, needed a lot of assistance uh, early on. They're doing fantastic now, and, and it's just really great to see. And... Um, needed a lot of assistance. And, and, and I, I dreaded this. Every time the conversation came out, every time the phone rang, I knew they needed something. They needed something. And I got to the point where I'm like, I had to say, no, enough. We have to stop. Stop calling me in the middle of the night. Stop asking for, like, it just got to that point. And they don't take no for an answer. And then they're offended that you're pulling back and you're putting up these boundaries. Well, don't you love me? Oh, I mean, and, and I, I can just tell, like, some of us are resonating with this. We, we all have somebody in our lives like that. But they often struggle to understand boundaries. And the third thing is this. They struggle to develop a biblical identity. This one's hard. 
This one's so hard. And what I mean by that is that these are people who are insecure. They're insecure and they're trying to live vicariously through you or through someone else. Because they're insecure in their own situation, in their own identity. They've never really established that. And they believe what they think about themselves versus what God says about them. And fundamentally, when you boil it down, that's the definition of shame. Is that you believe a false narrative about yourself versus what is true. And as a result, you struggle to build and develop a biblical identity. So, so these five markers and these three nuances are kind of how we identify needy people and how we can kind of get into their world a little bit and understand where they're coming from. And what I want to do is spend the rest of our time talking about three thoughts I think that will help us in how we move forward. How do we love people? How do we help needy people without hurting them? Because we, we want to help them in a way that's beneficial in the long run. But sometimes we try to help and we end up hurting them and we end up hurting ourselves. So how do we help without hurting them? Here's the first idea that I want to submit to you. The first thing that we do is that we give strategically. We give to them strategically. This is the first thought, okay? Now this is different from giving emotionally. When I say we're giving emotionally, what I mean is it's the thing that makes you on the other end feel good. It's the thing that relieves your guilt. So you're walking down the street and you see somebody sitting there that's, you know, life's been rough on them and they have the sign next to them and you throw them a dollar. Well, now you feel good about yourself. Yeah, okay, I relieve that guilt. It's impulsive. It's in that moment. That's emotionally giving. We're not talking about emotionally giving. What I'm talking about is strategically giving. We give to them strategically. Instead of focusing on the very thing that we just talked about, instead of focusing on what they want, the thing that gives us relief, we need to focus on what they need, what will really help. Not emotional giving, but prayerful, strategic giving. And we have this story in Acts chapter 3, and you may be familiar with it, but it's when uh, Peter and John are going to the temple in the middle of the afternoon, and they're on their way into the temple, and this guy who's been lame from birth is carried by someone else to the temple, and he's sat at the gate every single day, and he sits there to beg. That's what the scripture says. And then in verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 3, it picks up. It says, when he saw Peter and John, this is the lame guy sitting at the gates, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. And Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave him his attention, expecting to get something from them. Peter and John say, look at us. And he goes, oh. And what happens is, is that this guy thought something was coming. You see, those are hurting, and, and, I, and I say this with all due respect, and I say this as gently as I can, but well, oftentimes what happens is people who are desperately hurting have learned that if I'm loud enough for long enough, somebody will help. If I'm loud enough for long enough, someone will help. And then what happens is that we're walking by the gate at the temple and we see this thing and it's like, okay, emotionally give, okay, I feel good. All right, I, I'm relieved of that guilt. But really what we need to do is give them what that person needs. So in this passage, when we look back at Peter and John, let me ask you a question. What did the lame man want? What did he want? Money. Bible says it right there. It says that he asked them for money. What would be easy to give him? Money. <laughs> right? So he asked for money. That's what he wanted. It would have been very easy to give him money. Tossing him some loose change, it's easy, low commitment, we feel good. Here's what happens, verse 6. And Peter said, but what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the hand, at the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. This guy's sitting there waiting for a handout. In fact, he had gotten so good at it that he had somebody carrying him to the temple every day, every single day to beg. He wanted something. He's looking for a handout, but what instead he got was a miraculous hand up. And now he's walking. Because 
what, what Peter and John did and ultimately what we need to do with these needy, with, with needy people is say, because I love you, I'm not going to give you what you want, but instead I'm going to figure out what do you need. I'm going to give strategically. But, but the thing is, is that if you really loved me, you would give me your attention. You'd give me money. You would give me your time. And that's often the, the response that we'll hear, and then it kind of just turns our heart up again. But the fact of the matter is, is that you see, you want my attention, but really what you want is for me to validate you. But what you need is to love and accept yourself as, how, as who God created you to be. Well, you want more time with me, but really what you need is to develop your own identity. Well, how can we do that? How can we help them? You see, I'm not just going to do what this individual wants. I'm going to try to do what is right, try to give what they need. I'm not just going to tell you what you want to hear. But lovingly, I'm going to tell you what you need to hear. Last week, um, in between services, I was in the back office and I was talking to Rick. He's our, um, our online host. And we just got into this conversation and he was talking about how you know, God has been really working in his life and he's getting ready for vacation and all these different things. And I asked him if I could tell this story. And we got into the conversation. He was talking about his daughter. And he said, yeah, my, my daughter, she's doing great. She's in this church down south. And uh, he starts to go and he says, yeah, she was, a, she was a drug addict, really bad drug addict, had four kids out of state and had run into some trouble with the law, had gotten pulled over. There, were, there was, I think she got arrested for possession or something like that. There was someone else's in the car. I don't, I don't know the details. Anyway, she got jammed up. She got really jammed up. And she calls Rick, her dad, and says, listen, I'm in trouble. I need, can, you know, I, I need a place to stay. Um, can I come live with you? And Rick was telling me that be, because of the encouragement of his small group and trying to work through this, this biblical idea of giving strategically, he said, honey, I can't. You can't come live with me. Now, and he said, as a father, it was tearing him apart. It was tearing him apart not to be able to do this, but he said, I knew, this, this, this blew my mind, he said, I knew that if I let her and the kids come live with me, I would take away her decision of where she was going to sleep and where she was going to get food, and it was going to create this perpetual cycle. And him and his wife had to prayerfully, strategically give and say, we will support you, we will pray for you, but here's what you need. She ended up getting into a home getting clean, now she's serving in a church, and now she has this vibrant ministry of reaching out to other women who are in the same thing. Had Rick said yes to give in to that want, I wonder what that trajectory would look like. So we need to give strategically, not emotionally. Give strategically, not emotionally. The second way that we can love these people is that we serve them wisely. We serve them wisely. Now, this is a principle we see all throughout the New Testament, and I absolutely love this. You, you look throughout the Gospels, and you see Jesus doing some crazy stuff. He is serving selflessly. He is teaching faithfully. He is loving authentically. He is listening compassionately. He is giving generously. And then something happens in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 35. He stops. If just for a moment... He stops to go off by himself to recharge, to be with God. In order for you to keep giving out, you have to stop to fill up. It is so important. And we live in a culture that says something completely different. So you just go, 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 go. Until you're belly up on the ground and you can't move anymore. No. In order for you to keep giving out, you have to stop to fill up. Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Now, what had happened was Jesus was summoned to Simon's mother-in-law, who is really ill, and heals her. The word gets out that Jesus did this, and the whole town shows up. And the Bible says in the earlier part of, chap of, of Mark uh, that all the people are coming in, and he's healing them, and he's casting out demons. The whole town, they all showed up. Then the next section, it says, very early in the morning, verse 35, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left his house, and went off to a solitary place. The literal translation of solitary place means unpopulated and secluded. Where he prayed. 
And then verse 36, Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you, Jesus. Everyone is looking for you. And then he tells them, we're gonna, I'm going to go somewhere else and we're going to preach because that's why I came. But the idea was that he took a moment, a deliberate moment to pause, to pray to God, to recharge. And I'm reminded now, if you've had little kids or uh, you, you know what I'm talking about. I remember my wife went through this, is that she would just get in the middle of the day and she's raising her, her kids when they were young. And th- there comes a point in the day where she had to go run and hide in the bathroom. Just to, oh, I, I'm seeing an amen. <laughs> she had to run and hide in the bathroom and she locks the door and the kids are freaking out. She's like, oh, and then all of a sudden the little fingers start coming under the door. Mommy, where are you? What are you doing, mommy? Mommy! And then she's just like, oh my gosh, I just need a moment. Just stop. And that's kind of what Jesus was going through here. (laughs) You know, all the apostles' fingers are like, Jesus, everybody's looking for you. But you know, when when you're on an airplane and they warn you about those scary masks that are going to fall down, it looks like out of an alien movie or something, that's not scary at all. We're not going to die. It's okay. But what do they tell you when those masks fall down? Put yours on first before you put it on your kids or the person with you. Because if you're not breathing, you can't help them. Right? Right? In order for you to keep giving out, you have to stop to fill up. In Luke chapter 10, we have this story, uh, the story of the Good Samaritan, maybe you've heard it, where this Jewish guy is heading to Jericho from Jerusalem, and he gets beat up, and he's left for dead on the side of the road. And a Samaritan comes along to help this Jewish guy. Now, in the context, that's a big deal, because Samaritans and Jews did not mix, okay? They avoided each other like the plague, and there's a whole history behind that. But the Samaritan comes along and helps this Jewish guy. And the Bible says that he cares for him, he bandages him up, he puts oil on his wounds, he buys him a hotel room, stays with him, cares for him. The next day he says, all right, he pays for the room and tells the innkeeper, take care of him until I come back. Take care of him until I come back. Well, where did he go? What was he doing? The Bible doesn't say exactly what happened, but the point is this, is that he went away so that he could come back. He went away so he could come back. You see, if you're always pouring out on empty, eventually you burn out. Eventually you're depleted. Here's what I'm going to say. You can't say yes often if you don't say no occasionally. I'm going to say that again. You can't say yes often if you don't say no occasionally. Let that sink in. It is not hurtful I'm going to give you permission right now. It is not hurtful to say no. Because sometimes you have to step back and you have to recharge. I've seen this happen to myself and my own family. I've seen this happen in the church where you get to this point of burnout. And if you never experienced burnout, avoid it because it's awful. Sent me into counseling, this whole thing. It was an awful experience where you have nothing left. Emotionally, spiritually, you are drained. You are depleted. Some people call it compassion fatigue. That no matter what you do, no matter how many people you help, you're constantly pouring out and there's nothing left to give. In order to say yes, often you must say no occasionally. Okay? So we're going to give strategically to needy people. We're going to serve wisely to needy people. And then the third is this. We're going to trust God completely. Now, let me dig into this a little bit. We're going to trust God completely. We are going to help needy people the way that God leads us to help. And then we are going to trust him with the consequences. We're going to help the way that God leads us to help, and we're going to trust him to play out the consequences. And here's what I want to say, and I've met a lot of people, and I know you guys, a lot of you mean well, but I'm going to, I'm going to say this right now. If you think that God needs you to fix everyone, your God is too small. If you think God needs you to fix everyone, your God is too small. It is insulting and dangerous to think that you are someone's answer. You can't go there. Jesus is the only answer. Jesus is the only answer. We are simply the servants. He is the power. We are the conduit. We don't do that. You know, we talked about this a while ago. We did this series on prayer, and, and Pastor Brian's really been digging into us, and, and sometimes people, like, get upset by this, but we say, listen, you say, all oh, the power of prayer. 
No, it's not the power of prayer. It's the power of whom we pray to that answers those prayers. The action is simply the means and how we communicate. But it is God who's ultimately doing that. Jesus is that answer. Now, Paul writes this really interesting section in Galatians chapter 6. He's teaching about how uh, he's teaching about our actions and that there's spiritual consequences to our actions in Galatians 6. He says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Then he goes into the bad news and he says, Whoever sows to please the flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. But then he turns to the good and he says, Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. Whatever you plant in the ground, that's what you're going to get. If you plant corn, you're not going to get a pumpkin. If you plant an apple, you're not going to get a watermelon. So don't be surprised when it doesn't come up different than what you planted. Because the Bible's clear, a man will reap what he sows. And this is a principle we see all through scripture. Now if we if we plant a seed for our own selfish desires, whatever that may be, I'm the answer to someone's prayer, or I'm this, I'm that, whatever it is. Well, ultimately, it's selfishness, and that's what you're going to reap in the end. But if you're doing something to please God and align with his will, there's going to be joy and everlasting life. You reap what you sow. In the same gospel, in, in the gospel of Luke, in uh, chapter 15, we have the story of the prodigal son. Another famous story, the lost son who, who is returned. The, 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 I'll summarize it. There's these two sons, and the one son wants dad to croak, and he's not. And he's like, all right, since you're not dying, can I have my inheritance now? I really want this now. And so the dad, lovingly, for some reason, gives him the inheritance. So what does he do? He leaves home. He doesn't want to be there anymore. He parties hard. He's going and he's just ripping up the town with God only knows who and what and where and when. You know, he's kind of smoking that funny weed and just doing his thing. And he's partying hard. And he hits rock bottom to the point where he's literally sleeping with the pigs because then life gets real hard. There's a famine that hits. And then he's sitting there thinking like, huh, I guess that was a stupid idea. Just wasted all my inheritance. And then he comes to his senses and he says, you know, maybe my dad will take me back. Maybe he'll take me back. Even as a servant, maybe he'll take me back. But here's what's interesting. The father loved his son dearly. The Bible is very clear on that. He waited for his son. He prayed for his son. But what didn't he do? He didn't rescue his son. He didn't rescue his son. He let him hit rock bottom and he came to his senses and came back. He trusted God completely with the consequences of what was going to happen. In that he loved him. He, you see, he gave to his son strategically. He served him wisely. He trusted God in the consequences of his own son. And his son got what he sowed. He reaped what he sowed. Hear me on this. Rescuing is not always helping. Rescuing is not always helping. I'm talking, Mama, I'm talking to you. Rescuing is not always helping. Daddy, I'm talking to you. Rescuing is not always helping. If you're always, you're, if you're always her alarm clock and she's late for work every single day well, and then you don't do, well, you know what? She might need to lose that job. Or, or if, if he's partying his brains out at school and he's just doing this thing, he's not going to class, he might need to lose that scholarship to kind of learn from that and pick himself back up. If this person's charging up debt and they're up to their eyeballs in debt, but they're going on these fancy vacations, they just bought a Gucci purse and they bought three new outfits and a brand new car, but they can't pay the rent, they might need to be evicted. And I know that sounds harsh, but the idea is that rescuing is not always helping. I have another story of a college professor who was a, a dear friend of ours. He was, an, uh, he was our gospel teacher, but he was also um, an interim pastor at a local church that I was serving in. And his son, unfortunately, was a heroin addict. And we knew him. He was a great kid. Um, but he fell real hard a second time. And uh, his dad finally said, listen, I've let you come back four times. You can't come back this time. He's like, where am I going to live? He's like, you can't come back this time. He says, I love you. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to get you the support that you need, but you can't live here because of the model that it's setting for your sister, the turmoil it's creating in the house, and we're enabling you. 
And ultimately, he was homeless, I think, for a few weeks, but was able to get back up on his feet, realize what had happened, and God worked in his life. And then he started preaching the gospel, and it was just an amazing thing. But rescuing isn't always helping. And we have to be careful in these moments because it's easy for us to get to a place where we start to feel superior. I'm just going to call it like I see it. It's, we have to be careful not to feel that we're superior, that this individual, this person in need becomes a project. No, needy people are not projects that we help. They are people that we love. They are not projects that we help. They are people that we love. Because in the end, in the end, ultimately, we are all needy people. In one way, shape, or form, we are all needy people. Some of us in different positions were able to help someone in a specific way, but you have to remember that you're hurt too. At times, you were lonely. At times, you weren't sure where to look. You might be in a situation where you can help the financially impoverished, and that's great. But sometimes we're relationally needy. Someone else is. We can come alongside that. Sometimes we're spiritually needy, and oftentimes that's where we all relate to one another. David wrote this in Psalm 70. He says, but as for me, I am poor and needy. Come quickly to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. Lord, do not delay. We're all needy in the end. We're all needy in the end. And we need to find healing in community. And that's what the beauty of the church is. So many different people of different walks of life, different backgrounds, different experiences, different hangups, all coming together under one banner, the banner of Jesus Christ to be able to help one another, to do life together, to walk alongside one another, to find healing, because we need each other. Here's the thing is that I am not your answer. The pastors here are not your answer, and you are not my answer. I'm simply here to point you to Jesus and letting you point me to Jesus, because ultimately Christ is the only one who can meet all of those needs. So when we run into these people who we think suck the life out of us, they're needy, they're overly needy, these are the three things that I want you to remember that you're to, we're going to give strategically. We're going to serve wisely, and we're going to trust God completely. There is only one answer, and that answer is Jesus Christ. Now, some of you might be here this morning trying to figure out, yeah, this all sounds great, but you're still spiritually needy. You're still spiritually in a place where you're just not sure how this all fits together, and, and it won't fit together until you commit your life to Christ. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer in just a moment. But for those of you who know Christ, who are a Christian, are a child of God, please understand all of these things that we need to give strategically. We need to serve wisely, and we need to trust God completely. Let's not judge somebody for the speck in their own eye when we have a log in our own. We are simply needy people as well. But different hurts, different hang-ups, different experiences lead us to different places. And the church comes together to meet those needs. Do you pray with me? Father, we thank you and praise you for your son Jesus coming to die upon the cross for us, Lord, to meet our greatest need spiritually. That we, our, our need is that we were separated from you with a condemnation of sin and death but Lord, you are the only one who can meet that need. I know that I am not the answer to someone. Lord, that is simply you working through me, through everybody in this church. But Lord, your Bible is clear. Scripture is clear. That we're to confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. That he died and on the third day rose again. And Lord, that if we believe, we accept him, you tell us that we are forgiven. You tell us we are now a child of God. You tell us that your Holy Spirit now dwells within us. You tell us that we are a new creation. And Father, with all of that, so many things change. And Lord, that you would lead us to help us give strategically, to serve wisely, to trust you completely. Lord, we give our lives to you. Now, if you're praying that prayer right now and you've just had it, You've had it of being needy. You want to be able to help those who are in need in a biblical way. Just pray that prayer with me. Father, forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of my sin. I know I've broken your heart. 
and I ask for you to come into my life. I submit to you. I give my life to you. I praise you because of it. And for those of us who've made that decision long ago, I pray that we would recognize that we too are needy. And together, through this amazing thing called the church, we can find healing and community. And the only validation, attention, time that we need is that time with you, but you work through other people. So God, we commit this time to you. We thank you for it. And we praise you in your son's mighty and awesome name. Amen. Hey, if you just prayed that prayer with Pastor Brian just now, I want to encourage you to let us know about it because you just made a huge decision, the best decision. We want to come alongside you as a church and support you in that. So you can go to lakeshorechurch.org connect or within the Lakeshore app, just click the connect button, tap the option that says you're making a first-time faith commitment and we'll be in touch to get you plugged into some classes, get you a Bible or whatever other resources you need to grow in your new faith. Well, I want to remind you too, we didn't talk about this at uh, the beginning of the message today or the service, but next week we are having our second ever Turkey Bowl. Basically, our Lakeshore Kids and Lakeshore Students Ministries come together and they put on a super awesome event for families, whether you've got really young kids to all the way up teenagers. And honestly, if you're just an adult and you want to come hang out too, that's totally fine. They would love to have you. So that's this Sunday, November 5th from 2 to 6 p.m. You don't have to sign up, but if you want to take part in the flag football competition or the chili cook-off, just go to lakeshorechurch.org slash turkey bowl to make sure you register. But hey, next week also, our senior pastor, Vincey Paula, will be back continuing our relational vampire series. So we'd love to see you online or in person for that. But until then, have a great rest of your week and thanks for joining us.